If a Martian anthropologist were to wander around London today, one thing such a Martian might notice might be the existence of a strange cult. The cult, he, she, or it might think of a female goddess who we could find on Blackfriars Bridge, on the Strand, on the Mall, onto Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace Gardens. We can also find this cultic figure in Birmingham and around what was the British Empire. We're looking here, of course, at statues of Queen Victoria. And what I want to talk about today is, is the connection between monarchy and religion in London, primarily but not exclusively in Victorian London. Uh, and what I want to suggest today is that there's been a very strong connection between the rituals of power, the rituals of monarchy as they developed in London, and the religion of the British. And as we've just seen, not just the British, but also the peoples that they colonised. Why did people come to look on Queen Victoria with an almost quasi-religious uh, veneration? And what can we conclude about the kind of patterns of thought uh, and emotion that were laid down uh, in the cult uh, of the monarchy in the 19th uh, century? London has, has always been, but increasingly from the 19th century onwards, became a kind of stage set for the rituals of the British monarchy. These are scenes from the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, coronation procession on the left there, and her coronation in Westminster Abbey on the right. The monarchy in Britain has been a great inventor of traditions, rituals coined in the 19th century continue to be repeated with, of course, some uh, variations up to the present. So here is Queen Victoria uh, arriving outside St Paul's Cathedral, in front of the steps of St Paul's Cathedral, for her Diamond Jubilee in 1897, celebrating 60 years on the throne. The Queen, at this stage of her life, was very old, and very fat, and being the queen, she got to make the rules, so she decided, I'm not actually going to get out of my carriage and go into St Paul's for a Thanksgiving service, so they kind of did it on the steps. But what's very striking is that if we scroll ahead to 2002, Queen Elizabeth's jubilee, we can see that coach, the coach pulling up once more at the steps of St Paul's. But this makes the point for us that royal rituals are intensely conscious of tradition. And really the, the study in earnest of the monarchy and monarchical ritual in Britain begins in the kind of 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. And, and the first thing to say about that study was it, it, it tended to be sceptical. The historian David Canadine wrote an extremely influential essay about monarchical ritual in 1992, which appeared in a volume called The Invention of Tradition. He says, go back to late 18th, early 19th century Britain, and you'll find that this is a society that, that set very little store on processions, on coronations, on displays of all kinds. The idea that, that the British were a people that enjoyed or were good at ritual display was very hard to find. Jump forward to the late 19th, early 20th century, or, or even to the recent present, and we're very familiar with this idea that, that the British love the monarchy and that they love watching monarchical rituals. Canadine says that actually, then, something quite, quite specific has happened in the intervening period, and that's that the monarchy and its defenders have, if you like, invented these spectacles. Why have they done so? Canadine argues two reasons, really. The first is that over the 19th century, the political power of the monarchy wanes. The monarchy loses, if you like, its real power, its power to intervene in political life. So by way of compensation, Canadine says, the idea of the monarchy as an institution that carries out meaningful rituals becomes conversely much more important. Reason number two, as we enter the 20th century, is not just the decline in the political power of the monarchy, but the decline in Britain's power as an imperial power. As Britain becomes just a little island uh, off the coast of Europe, as it begins to lose its empire, Canadine argues the British need to find new ways of celebrating and defining their national identity. And one of those turns out to be ceremony and display. So on this reading, 
there's not an awful lot to find of significance in monarchical rituals. They're simply invented by British elites to sort of distract the British population from the realities of royal and then imperial decline. The study in particular of Queen Victoria's reign and of the royal jubilees by historians has, has in some ways confirmed this because historians that write on these jubilees tend to emphasize the extent to which they were worldly and materialistic events. What is the monarchy for today? One cynical answer might be to sell stuff. These, for instance, are adverts on the front page of the Times flogging viewing positions. These are people selling seats in their windows along the Strand leading up to St Paul's Cathedral where you could view the Queen and the procession. So the idea of, of jubilees in particular, the idea of monarchical rituals as primarily commercial, entertainment-driven events, it's something that we can definitely find evidence for. So that's by way of background. But what I want to suggest for the remainder of the lecture is that if we revisit some of these monarchical rituals, we can see that they were more, these, are, these events are more than just chapters in the history of mass entertainment, and they're more than simply compensations for the decline of the monarchy's political power. We can see people engaging with them in very real and powerful ways. So what this opens up to us is a third way, a third approach to the study of monarchical ritual that places less emphasis on the monarchy itself and its, its decision-making, less emphasis on the way in which ceremonies were choreographed by elites in British society, and one that focuses more on the British themselves, on their moral and here for this lecture, particularly their spiritual aspirations. What do people want to get out of monarchical rituals? What did people think the monarchy symbolized for them? The first thing I want to say about uh, Queen Victoria, who comes to the throne in 1837, is that she inherit, has in fact inherited already a very well-developed system of monarchical rituals. But what we can now go on to say is that, is that Victoria brings to this this set of monarchical rituals, something new and very valuable. And that really can be summed up by this painting by George Hayter of Queen Victoria taking the sacrament at her coronation. This is a young, as yet virginal woman taking a sacrament here. Religion is front and center to this um, coronation. And Hayter has imagined this as a moment at which the light is breaking through into Westminster Abbey, singling out, if you like, uh, God's uh, anointed. And this would continue throughout the early years of Queen Victoria's reign. Queen Victoria made a very, very convincing symbol for the aspirations of religious people, and particularly of Protestant, a, a sort of Protestant middle class. Now, 1872, uh, this first great display of monarchical ritual late in Queen Victoria's reign is followed by the Jubilees of 1887 and 1897, celebrating the Queen's long reign on the throne, thanking God for a long life, a long reign, and so on. How should we interpret these occasions? Why should we see these as having religious significance? For many people, the most exciting moment of the, of the 1897 Jubilee was the climax of the open-air service held at St Paul's, when the Archbishop of Canterbury, departing from the prescriptions of etiquette, got the whole crowd to cheer for the Queen, and this followed the national anthem. So we could see these, these occasions as, as basically uh, about, about a form of kind of cheerleading. But I want now just to dig in, in into a little bit of detail into what uh, religious people actually said about the Jubilees uh, and why they mattered to them. And when we do that, we find that, that actually there's less jingoism and more reflection, more kind of quiet reflection and humility being, being requested of, of the public than we might imagine. A feature of 1897 was on the Sunday before the Jubilee events in London, it was, it was decreed that churches up and down the land would have Thanksgiving services for the Jubilee. And the preaching on many of these occasions was quiet reflective and humble. Mandel Crichton, for instance, who was the newly appointed Bishop of London, 
preached in St. Paul's on text from 1 Peter, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And it was quite clear from what Crichton said that he did not want people to be chauvinistic or jingoistic in their interpretation of the Jubilee. Patriotism, Crichton told them, is a good. National thankfulness is better still, but we must not be exclusive. We must not be brexit -y. We must not lose ourselves in presumptuous vaporing. Nations are strong in proportion as they have a clear conception of a national destiny, but they must involve themselves, he argued, in the affairs of all Christendom. No nation has continued great that has not a growing consciousness of a universal mission founded in a general belief in justice and righteousness. So Crichton was under, under no illusions that there's nothing reactionary or backward-looking about celebrating uh, the British monarchy. The monarchy for Crichton is a symbol not of British greatness, but of the values that the British share with other peoples. So although we tend to think of the Jubilees often as being about consumption and entertainment, for a lot of people, they were about philanthropy. One last example of that, we began with the statue of Queen Victoria on Blackfriars Bridge. That statue was erected by this man, Sir Alfred Haslam. And for him, too, the monarchy was not about display primarily, even though he paid for that statue, it was about doing good. So I think really that's a, a good point on which to end. Um, and it allows us to, to, to see, therefore, that although monarchical ritual has been very important to religious people in Britain, it's been important only in proportion as it can be seen as religious and as compatible with religion. It gives us a picture that the, I suppose the monarchy would do well to remember, that it's the loyalty and the enthusiasm it commands in Britain has always been of a very critical and of a very conditional kind. Thank you.